Coming from Amazon, just got renewed for season two. Uh, we have a very special guest to go over this premiere season, a new member of the TDI family and an official video game correspondent for TDI. May we introduce Joey G, snap it up. It's an honor, it's a privilege. This has been a, a long time coming and uh, happy to be here, happy to be part of the fam here. Joey G, I have a lot of questions for you. Uh, Ricky, Ricky Flex and I are noobs. We don't know anything about Fallout. We just walked in blind to this season, and we were pretty blown away by it. Um, it seems like a really expansive world, and it seems like it has characters that we have become attached to in the first season. But I just want to get to know your expertise, because I have been told you have logged hours upon hours playing this game. Days. Tell us what your expertise level is for fallout so you got to realize fallout you're talking about one of the most iconic video game series the past two decades or so so my i i didn't play all of them but i am familiar with the most recent massive hit that they had which was fallout 4 and so i think this show is mostly um taking from that show because it just has the most content uh it was the most successful um, but this, I mean, this is a, this is a game that goes back to the, to the nineties. Mm. This is, we were talking like 2d, you know, scrolling, scrolling games here. So these guys know what they're doing. So this is a studio called Bethesda that these guys, it's a small studio. It's about, I think it's like two to 300 people, but these guys put out just mega hits. And so when I, when I heard that this was coming out, I was, I was blown away. <laughs> there's there's so much so much that they can do here so this is what i was curious about um since it has such a long history uh is this something where people have been looking for a fallout project for a long time whether it's been like tv or film or were you like this is only meant to be a video game were you shocked that a series i was, was announced? i was honestly shocked i i i think they made the right call doing a series as opposed to a movie but man, like it never crossed my mind that they'd be doing this and the fact that they're teaming up with Amazon and they're they're like helping them craft the storyline is is awesome. What's also interesting, and I'll let Ricky hop in in a second, is that I've heard that this series is canon to the game, and which means what? Like, does that mean that the stories in the game in the show can now be implemented in the next update for the game, and you can play as these characters? What's exactly mean when yeah. you say it's canon? Yeah, so it's 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 interesting you say that. So Fallout Four came is came out in the mid um, 2010s, and everybody's been anxiously waiting for a Fallout Five, and nobody has said uh, you know a date. Nobody's given much information, and now this is kind of like, yeah, this kind of gives an avenue. Are we going to be playing as like Lucy in the, in the next game? You know, um, and I will say, while I, I'm not familiar with all of the the storylines with the other Fallout, so it's not uh, it, it almost like a Halo. It's not like you're playing Halo and you're always going to see Master Chief. You're always you're like a different person. You're in a different place in the in the country. You're in a different vault. So you know none of the games line up uh, with the same storyline. So it's just like with this show, they're creating like a new divergence at a different vault. Wow. So it would be perfect for them to go off of this to to make number five. It's such a like a wide open landscape, you know. When I was like when I was watching this, it's I, a wasteland. I, Dave. Yeah, I, it's, it's so it's, it was insanely expansive. I know I. It seems like there's limitless possibilities. I had no idea if characters are carrying over, or is it just like they're shells of these characters and like this show, the showrunners and the writers kind of carve their own story as if they were playing the games themselves. Uh, I know Ricky Flex has a bunch of questions for you about like the world and the gameplay, so I'll just hand it off to him for a sec. Well, first off. Joey G, a long Ricky. time coming. Thank you for coming on. Um, Absolutely. But just to go off what you guys are just saying, like this wasteland, like like Doc was saying, like there's just so many, like it's just so vast, like the amount of stories that you could tell in here. And like they, there's four games. Obviously, this is canon now. And you could see that this was meant to be a TV show, you know, just because of that reason. Like this, if this was a movie, 
it would just be way too like it would it would have a limit. There would be a ceiling, a cap on it. Here it's like crap. Like we could have four or five seasons of the show minimum. I, I, obviously, it probably won't be just because of logistics, but like it makes sense why it's a show. And I love the world building that they did here with the different factions. How there's like yes, it's like Lucy's a central character, but like there's really four main storylines going on, and they're all like interwe- interweening around each other. Like this show really like came came across i was really hyped up for it after the trailer and the budget i saw walter got walton goggins one of my guys but i loved it i absolutely loved the show yeah you're so you're 100 percent right so i'm going to tell you a little snippet here so the same the same studio uh bethesda they uh have they, there's another series same thing going back to the 90s which i'm sure you guys have heard in passing at some point but um a game called skyrim oh yeah uh, elder scroll elder scrolls so there is a, a common phrase that the that the young young kids like to say nowadays called NPCs, non playable characters. Mm-hmm. Skyrim is the it. originator of NPCs. That's where it came from. So these games are littered with characters and just like these unique situations. And like and as you play these games, it's just so many little uh, you know branches of storyline. And that that's the most entertaining part of the game, in my opinion, is just all the little like the people that you meet and things like that. So um, it's it's yeah, like this is what they do. They, they're just content machines. There's so many little things. I feel like this type of canvas, the open landscape it seems like Skyrim's the same type of thing. Exactly. And like with all these like video game adaptations, like the most successful we've seen, it seems like everything TV format for video games is the way to go. But The Last of Us. Did you watch The Last of Us? Can't say I have. But have you played the game? Wow. Interesting. No, okay. I'm a little behind there. So, like, <laughs> we're supposed to be I talking think, about Fallout. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but just successful TV adaptations. It's probably Apocalyptic Fallout and worlds. The Last of Us. And The Last yes. of Us is a little more like prestige. And the way the difference I've heard and I've read about is like when you play The Last of Us, it's like a script that's already been written. You're just following along a journey. And here it's like these type of games, Skyrim and Fallout, right? It just has so many different directions you can go. Like as someone who hasn't played the game, but putting myself potentially like in the shoes of like yourself and all these other fans, I'd be kind of nervous. Like they might screw this up, you know, like how are you going to be able to faithfully adapt this when it's such an open landscape, you know? So like you as a fan, what were you looking for? Like they're making a Fallout TV show. I got to see this. What were you looking for? Yeah. So um i'm not going to try and give up too much here but there are a few different factions that we haven't met yet at all in the show and um it ba- there is basically almost like a trifecta of uh groups that you know one has certain interactions with all of them and so we haven't we've only seen one and i'll, I'll say is the brotherhood of steel so they also took a unique turn i will say that kind of deviated from the game in the sense that uh there's this religious aspect to it that wasn't really prevalent so that is kind of a new a new uh uh, thing so it's almost like the uh the knights are kind of worshipped as like uh you know like divine creatures if you will Mm -hmm. and it almost gave me like uh like a like the sardaukar like dune 2 vibe where it's like there's like these really religious warriors um, so that was definitely unique, uh, in that sense, but I'm telling you in these next seasons, these other factions are going to get introduced to the show and it brings a whole like power dynamic into it that gets very interesting. And, uh, in the ser- in the game series, at least you're, you kind of align with one of the three, there's really like four factions and that kind of tailors your story. And so you stick with like that faction through the whole game. And so it's going to be interesting how they, cause obviously they can't do that with the show. There's, there has to be, you know, all parties represented. So it's going to be interesting. It's definitely set up well. So they've only scratched the surface. A hundred percent. There's a lot more to come. I'm sure. We, we've had three vaults, like the triangle, you know, and then we've had like the places that I was thinking about, like if I was playing a game, if I was, if I was in the fallout world, uh, the Philly, like that that town, Philly. I assume that is a place that you could go in the game. You can access resources. You interact with a bunch of different people. You could have like violent interactions with people. It's like that type of stuff in the game too. And then they do like 
like the music you talked about with me earlier, like, is that a huge part of the game too? Like, is that those type of details? Do you think the show like did well adapting that stuff? Yeah. So what the interesting thing is, um, so this one happened in the California area, right? Uh, I'm not sure exactly where, where it was supposed to be in the show, but um, so for example, in fallout four, they were in Boston. That's where the vault was. So there's kind of different communities in these different places. So while there's not, um, you know, a direct, you know, copy in the game in the show, um, I'll give you the example from Fallout 4, there was Diamond City. So if you can guess where that city was, it was inside the, uh, the Green Monster. No way, dude. Wow. So that was like their big city. It was called Diamond City. Um, and so that is that does reflect, uh, you know, from both the show and the game, they have these communities in like certain marquee locations and uh, because they're in different parts of the country. And that's that's like kind of how the story just keeps growing there, you know. And I guess just to chime in here, uh, I should just say before I say the spoiler, like if you haven't watched Fallout, you should probably end the pod and come back to it uh, after you watch it. But a question here. So. I think I did not play the game. My roommate in college, Johnny Sims, Star Wars correspondent, uh, he played the game. Um, which So at the end of this season, right, and you see Hank looking at that city, is that Vegas? And that was that like a big part of the game? So one of the spinoff games was called Fallout New Vegas. New Vegas, um, okay. So as far as if that was supposed to be vegas i'm not sure um i i forget what that city was called um in the show uh that that was the city with like thirty thousand, right it was like the ending uh scene it just to me like you saw the big balloon like you see like it kind of looked like a vegas but like obviously apocalyptic so i think that was i think that was the same city um that was blown up the second time that uh maximus was from okay yeah okay I'm not sure if that was supposed to be Vegas or not, though. Um, okay. But maybe that was a, you know, a uh, a wink to fall out New Vegas. Definitely. That's possible. what I was alluding to. Like maybe yeah. it was like a wink to like, oh, this is good. the next kind of area we're gonna tackle here. And I don't know, like obviously Coop slash the Ghoul and Lucy are gonna have to get there and go through all these different factions that you're talking about that we haven't even met yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One uh, one other part of this because because it was obviously very prevalent in the last episode, but. Um, this aura of just like evil around vault is also seemingly new to this series. Um, you know, the, the kind of evil undertones and they have all this planning that's not really prevalent in the game. In the game, it, it really just seems like they were trying to keep people alive. Um, so it's interesting where they're going with that as well. And you know, might... the fact that Lucy's father was involved in all of this as well. Yeah. So, uh, the, the other type of research I did for this or, as in looking through Twitter. Uh, I heard it, was it China versus the U.S. in the game or something like that? It was like countries versus each other, the U.S. versus another country. And since this is canon, and you're just saying that vault wasn't really like the evil under, like big mm. bad in the game. So for the next game, they're probably going to be the, they just completely changed it. They're going to be like the big bad, right? So that might have been a revelation of the story, yeah, um, that we had known up to this point. Yeah, I wanted to talk about the tone and get to like the actual details of the show, but to go on with the vault thing, um, I didn't anticipate this watching the show. Like they kept on hinting at vault They talked about Coop's wife, like right? the ghoul's wife. And I thought the finale really packed a punch and set up vault as the ultimate big bad. Right. I didn't really, I didn't really see that coming in the way that it kind of transpired in the show. Um, I thought this is a show where the bookends were so good, like the premiere and the finale. Um, I thought the buildup in the middle of the season was kind of lackluster, but that huge reveal at the end that Coop's wife and the idea that vault is the one who dropped the bombs. And that might not have even been a part of the lore of the game. Like you're talking about, that must've been a massive revelation. Like, do you think people are going to respond well to that? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the thing is, I see, I, I I don't really have a problem with it. I'm okay with that fitting into the story because honestly, um, the you know, the games kind of start after that stuff has already happened, after the bombs like have dropped. Fallout 4 starts right when it happens, and you know, the next thing you know, you're in, in the vault. Um it it was never really concerned with me for the storyline. 
Um, but it's definitely re- you know a revelation. And they don't make it clear, at least in Fallout 4, you know who is bombing who or who starts it or what have you. I, I think that was a good move, I think, for them in the show to have vault potentially like being framed as the ones who dropped the bomb because I can tell early on from the first episode, this is like a show. It's, it's a fun watch. It's, I don't think it's a very deep watch. It's not going to have me like pondering like days after watching it. It's just like a fun, you know, violent, gory, funny type of watch. Um, but I was, I was sensing like class difference immediately watching the show. Like those who are in the vault, I'm like, oh, okay, you got the rich people. Uh, you got the savages on the outside, right? Raiding the rich and like obviously trying to take these resources. I thought it was a good, like when you connect the first episode to the last one, uh, I think story-wise it made a lot of sense, right? Ricky Flick, mm-hmm. did it pack a punch for you? Yeah, yeah. I think the storylines were great all around here. Not just with the vaults, but like, just with the four story arcs, I think the the ghoul story, like Coop slash the ghoul, like there's still a lot like left on the bone that we have to figure out with that one. But that was very intriguing. The flashbacks were, I thought, spot on. If you do flashbacks, it's kind of a bold choice because, like again, it's kind of a cheat, a cheat. But it was very effective, especially in the th- the finale where it's trying to put these four storylines together. And they were utilizing the flashbacks. It was fantastic in my eyes, especially with the twist and turns and the dark, like the dark twist and turns. And especially, I did not see the wife being the one laying the hammer down, saying that mm-hmm. we're gonna drop the bomb. That was a turn that I just could not foresee. But overall, like, yeah, I think the Lucy arc, the Lucy's brother arc, I think the ghoul was great. The slash coop, the weakest one, which I think got better throughout the epi- uh, the series, was the Max slash brother. I think that one started a little slow and then caught steam uh, toward when Lucy came into the frame a little bit. I, I see, Joe, you're tilting your head a little bit. Yeah. You were line. Go ahead on Max. I, I, will, I will say I, I thought he was probably the worst part of the show so far. Just Agreed. Especially when they got to uh, Vault 4. Um, and, you know, he has the robot. He's eating caviar. And he just turns into, like, a slug like this guy is supposed to be like a brotherhood of steel guy and he just you know sits there um and like refuses to leave after all that i thought that was a little bit weird and it it, it i it just seemed a little bit lacking with him vault, vault when they went to vault four i think that was my least favorite part of the show to be honest. <laughs> like that but that's where it's like i think the first couple episodes i think there's a lot of momentum great premiere but when they went to vault four i get it it's important right they see moldaver is like being worshipped here ellie i mean not, not ellie ellie parnell is playing lucy lucy realizes the vaults may not be what she truly think they are it seems like she's starting to have like um a change in thought regarding the vaults like i get it it's important but to me pretty boring you know i just did i lot. wasn't as locked in about on, on that aspect um it was it's important to the character but um I thought Maximus, yeah, I was a little thrown off with his behavior in Vault 4, but the way he was just almost forgiven by the Brotherhood. Oh, and yeah. The way oh. they just put him on a pedestal for betraying his yeah. knight as a squire, <laughs> him just cutting corner after corner. And then all of a sudden, the leader of the Brotherhood is like, join me. Like he's like a Darth Vader to his Sith Lord. And then we're going to rule the Wasteland yes. together. I was like, what the hell is going on? I, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly how I feel. Ricky, you got it. You're like, that's what I'm saying. Like Maximus, like intriguing character, love like the environment around them. And I think he started off as a real badass, but by the end of it, right, I was just shaking my head saying, how did we get here? Okay, so I was taking it easy on him, but then you guys just took the hammer and just <laughs> hit him over the head. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The worst, worst storyline on the show. Um, I will just give him a, a, you know, a glimmer of hope here. I do think going into season two, you know, that battle between power and like doing the right thing I think is really going to come to fruition and be an interesting conflict and story. So I think there is some potential there for season two where maybe he is the Sith Lord, but next time he sees Lucy, like what's going to happen here? And if the show has balls, he would go bad and be like, I'm going to try to kill Lucy. That would be good. Yeah, I could see that happening too. And like you brought up Lucy. I want to talk about her a little bit. I was pretty sour on her to start. Um, She's really plucky. Um, she was pissing me off. So annoying at the beginning of the show, but intentionally annoying 
right? She's so naive and doesn't understand the wasteland and she's like raised a certain way, right? In the vault and she tries to bring that to the wasteland. But as it went on, as it progressed, by the end of it, I'm like, damn, I'm team Lucy. I'm with her. And to see her alongside the ghoul going into season two has me hype as shit. That, that was awesome to watch. They kind of built her up into like almost like a Ripley in Aliens type of character. You have her after taking out that robot, right, in that – I forgot what they were selling. The, what the ghoul's trying to get that stuff that keeps him alive and everything. When she takes out that robot, she comes out. She's got like the bandage across her shoulder. She has the new finger that she trades with the ghoul, right? And I'm like, okay. She's like fully turning into a badass now. But – I wasn't too emotionally invested into her story until that finale. The finale packed the punch, seeing her mother as the ghoul, seeing the twist, the betrayal of her father, right? I think it's setting her up to be a great, great, like, heroine type of character in season two. I think it ended on a strong note when I really was sour on her to start. Yeah, I'm all I'm all thumbs up. I think she did a good job. Um, she, uh, I, I thought at the end in the last episode, she kind of took the... Uh, the news like at face value didn't really question it much she kind of just turned right on her father which i thought was a little interesting after all she had been through she's just you know takes takes uh this random raider's word for it but um i'm okay with it i think she was overall pretty good character i i actually wasn't that sour on her from the start because i think she just fit the tone so well you know, like 50s, you have these needle drops of the 50s music. You have this vault community that they're all kind of corny. Like, I think she fit that tone really well. So I, I wasn't that – and she's not bad looking. Like, I honestly thought it was – She's hot. Fine. You could say it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. So – and then, obviously, I when she first, like, te- not teams up, but, like, the ghoul has her and, like, leading her to the head or leading him to the head – I was like, damn, I want them to team up. I was really thinking that during the time, and now we're going to get that for season two. Yeah. That's awesome. That is awesome. I, I, cool. This show was hitting, man. I'm telling you. Yeah. Like, it, it, like, for an apocalyptic show, a show that we've seen these dystopian societies, apocalyptic shows before, movies, right? And they have similar themes. Like, this one had to be unique and different. I think the tones, the central character in Lucy, um, like, again, 50s, uh, like, also, but like advanced tech, so it's kind of like Jetsons a little bit. Like it just had to be different, and like I think it hit. Like I think it hit really hard for me. She does make that turn that makes me so excited for season two, where she was so all in on the vaults, and now she's all in on the wasteland, and she was so into what her father preached to her, but now she had made that turn to what her mother really envisioned that she really never got to know, and to see Moldaver like have that type of like influence on her, and what that was kind of pretty unexpected twist where like she was on wanted posters. She was the big bad that they were setting up, but it turns out Moldaver is not really the villain here. At least they're not framing Moldaver as the villain and setting up for now the ghoul and Lucy to go back to the vaults. And it's going to have a totally different viewpoint for Lucy. You know, she's not going to be like embracing the vault. She's going to be saying, this is wrong. It's like just the, um, the, the change in perspective from the finale I think it really lent in like to anticipation levels, higher anticipation levels for season two. So I think I can pinpoint exactly when this series just skyrocketed for me. When they were walking through the barren, you know, wasteland and Lucy finally caved in and drank their, you know, radiated water. Oh yeah. And then they had the fight scene immediately after that, um, you know, with the finger biting I was like, it's turned like, you know, at that point, you knew that she was about to turn into a badass. And like, you know, she was in for it. She kind of like sold her soul at that point after drinking the water. I I couldn't agree more. That was like the moment where it's like she accepts her surroundings. She's gone full savage, you know, Uh, and she accepts the wasteland. I think I want to talk about the ghoul a little bit because he was by far my favorite character. Like, yeah, by a mile. What's so crazy is that he was my favorite character, but the entire time. I didn't know what his motivation was to get to Moldaver, right? So I thought, okay, he's a ghoul. He's, he's lasted 250 years. Uh, we have the flashbacks to him with his family, right? And then you have later stages, him with his wife and that dynamic. But the entire time, I'm like, he wants this head, but does he want it just so he can, like, pay off, right, to stay alive and have this medicine? What is this medicine called, Joe? Is this in the game? 
Um, so they're they're called chems is what yeah. they're taking, but they come in like different like varieties. As you like some of the stuff you saw, he was like injecting somewhere like pills and stuff. There are all these different chems. Okay. So like I thought he was like he's like this bounty hunter who's just collecting money, right? And like doing these duties so he can stay alive, right? And he's so good at his job, like he is an absolute like the goat of the goat of all ghouls. And then to see him in the finale to drop that bomb, like his family may still be alive. Where's my family? I thought the flashbacks in the last two episodes building up to that moment was pretty spectacular. It was pretty spectacular. But Walton Goggins, such a TV legend. Every time he is on the screen, one of the best character actors that we have, um, him in the getup, you know he's going to kill it every time he's in the suit, right? Every time he's in that makeup. It seems like the dialogue was on point, the line de deliveries, it seems like only he could say it the way he says it. And then you get to see like Walton Goggins actually as a normal dude, you know, as like a movie star in the dystopian like US 1950s type of vibe. That was cool to see. But I really thought no one else could have played the ghoul like that. You know, I thought he was a complete scene stealer. He was my favorite performance by an absolute mile, Ricky Flicks. Your thoughts, right? Goggins, your guy. He was perfect for this role. As we've talked about in the past, Justified, Hateful Eight, Django, that Western vibe, cowboy, perfect. Just enough recognizable where people know him, right? Also okay. vice principals. He has the humor attached to it, um, uh, to, like experience as well. But he's not too big of a star, like in real life, like Walton Goggins. Like he's not too big of a star where like if that was, I don't know, like a big time actor, maybe it's taking away too much from like the other storylines, right? But no, it's like, it just hit a sweet spot where this anti-hero vibe, like character was just an absolute beast and a scene stealer. It was perfect. And doc, I also agree with what you said about the dialogue. I knew like it confirmed my expectations for the show with him and how perfect the role was when his first lines, uh, when, he, when they like those like bandits, like wake him up from the grave and they're like one last uh, job. And then he goes, well, that just tells me you don't do it for the love of the game. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm in, baby. I'm in. Cowboy up. Let's go. <laughs> so perfect, absolute beast. This is perfect. Did you like him, Joe? A plus. A plus. I thought it was perfect. Goggins, Goggins, man. Like, I kept on thinking of Django. You know, like I'm like him looking down on Django on the horse, saying, like, yeah. I'm gonna be walking in the moonlight with you. Like, he is so good at the Texas draw, southern draw type of accent. He does it, and he he's my favorite performance in the Hateful Eight. Like I, I Walt Goggins is, and that's a cast that's like Kurt Russell, Jennifer Jason Lee, right? Samuel Jackson, Bruce Dern, the names go on and on. Walt and Goggins is my favorite part of that movie. Um, and to see him, he's kind of like the and Walton Goggins, like on the top billing or whatever you know he's the last guy listed but For a reason. he's like the lead now like he this is his show alongside lucy you know them in tandem interesting dynamic they had right and to see them both on the same page it got me really hyped going into the next season <laughs> um i did want to talk about a couple things because i didn't love everything about this season ricky flicks seems like you want to marry it and you're in love with it but right, right, take it easy, take it easy. i kind of had issues with the music and i want to talk about it with you joe um I get it, the dystopian U.S. 50s, right, those flashback sequences. It seems futuristic, but at the same time, it seems like we haven't moved from 1955. The music, I felt like the needle drops, I got sick of it. It was just too many. It was like four or five 1950 songs within one episode. And I thought it would have been, would have been way more effective if you just hit us every once in a while. Right. I just thought it was really over the top. But is that such a huge part of the video game that they had to include it here, Joe? To some ex to some extent, it is. Um, the music is the same way. It's all you're going to be hearing 1950s stuff. And there's also an element to the game where uh, you can basically tune into a radio. And uh, they I think they briefly showed it with um, uh, before Maximus got picked up by the Brotherhood of Steel again at the, the end. Fred, that guy. Fred Armisen character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. So um, the, in the games, there's a guy that runs like a radio station. And so like you could tune in and listen to music and you might go into like certain locations and there's like radios playing and stuff like that. So that is kind of a common theme. Um, so at least they, they did stick true to that. Flex, your thoughts on the music? You like it? I did like it. I, I, I understand your sentiment. I can't say you're wrong. Like, I think it's just like very opinion based. I think it fit. Yeah. And I think... Well, we could also talk about opinion based. Um, another thing on the tone is like the humor. 
the humor is it seems like this is a show that's been pilled by like the boys like amazon and you think about like the boys with such like gory violence and then it's kind of like there's an exclamation point put on but or at least maybe a period put on by a uh, a quick joke like after something awful that has just happened, you know? And then you saw that a lot in the vaults. I thought the humor worked in the vaults. Like you don't have, you don't have a lot of the star players there. So like you have the humor there. I think it works, but seeing it in the wasteland, some of it I thought was super cringy. Like when the guy who's saying he wants to fuck chickens, I was like, dude, what are we talking <laughs> about right now? I'm like, this is like, I get it. This is over the top, but I'm like, this is like trying to be Deadpool. This is trying to be the boys. This is trying to be a little bit of invincible, like two shows from Amazon. I just feel like it, there's a certain tone to these shows, there's certain expectations for the audience that they're trying to live up to. But um, I thought the hu- I read I like the violence and gore a lot more than the actual humor in the show. I thought it was forced at times. Uh, Joey G, any thoughts? Yeah. So I will say um, the guy that they met in the second ep- I want to say it was the second episode uh, as she's heading towards Philly. Like I thought that was like a good like you know perfect moderate humor. There's just this wacko wearing like a diaper, you know, trying to make like a water filter. Like you know that was good. But then they got to Vault 4, where um, Lucy's captured, and she's tied up. And, uh, you know, the Cyclops has a sword. And, and you know, he acts like he's going to cut her head off, you know, and lets her go. I, they tried to make that so funny, and I was like, I, I thought that was so forced. That was one of my least favorite parts of it. You felt that forced nature throughout, I think. Yeah. I, 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 I agree with uh, Doc in Vault 33, or... Yeah, 33. I thought the humor was spot on. It was hitting on all cylinders. You had the guy from Severance, uh, the guy in glasses, and he's in that commercial where, like, you know me, but you don't know my name. I still don't know your name, but I do recognize you. You're you're spot on in that commercial. He was firing all cylinders. Um, but, yeah, a lot of times it was forced. But I, I do want to say, give credit to the showrunners slash writers, directors. I think they did a great job, like, tackling the behind-the-scenes team. So, like, they had the co uh, co showrunners of Westworld, Jonathan Nolan, Chris's brother, and uh, Lucy something. I forget her last name. But those are, like, the story guys. But then you have a, a Graham Wagner, who is, like, the comedic guy, Silicon Valley, The Office, Portlandia, explains the Fred Armisen cameo. And then you have a couple other people, like a Robert Zendora, who did Tomb Raider and some other sci-fi stuff. Like, you have all these different feels for this show and this tone where you have, yeah, it's a prestige sci-fi dramedy. And yes, the comedy, I think, yes, you're right. I think it was too forced. But I think for the most part, it did a good job trying to blend all these together. And again, like I said in the beginning, you had to make it a little different versus most apocalyptic stuff where it's like so dreary and sad. Think of The Last of Us. So I think you needed some comedy in here. Was it forced at times? Yes, but you needed it. When when I think about like the vaults, the fault, the vault stuff, like – I didn't like the heavy drama that went with the vaults and like the brother of Lucy, like that wasn't my favorite part of the show, but it was a nice piece of comic relief. Every time you went down there, like all the effed up stuff you're seeing in the wasteland. And then you go down, it's like, they're having the overseer like vote. And it's just hilarious where they're running campaigns. Like I put up 10 posters. How did I not win? And uh, like the guy, like going into the, going into like vote, and casting his ballot, he's like, who am I kidding? And he votes against himself, you know? <laughs> I thought that type of stuff really worked. Um, that dude, shout out Zach Cherry. He was like the overweight dude with glasses. Mm-hmm. Absolutely understood the assignment, slayed the role. And then Dave registered by, I think Chet was um, the cousin also with the weird like like weird. sex dynamics of the show. Yeah, it's like the yeah. cousin with Lucy. It's like, they got no one else there. Um, yeah, so those those two were awesome. Other thoughts on the show, boys? Like, maybe, like, where do you think season two is going to go? This might be a good question for Joey G, knowing, unless, like, for Joey G, like, knowing the game. Like, do you, what do you predict we'll see that we haven't seen already? I, I don't want to, like, reveal the, the groups that I think are going to be emerging, but there is one uh, small thing that I think we're going to see that I think is, is okay to talk about here. And there's, um, there's essentially a, a militia that is patrolling the wasteland. It's called the Minutemen. Um, and they're basically the general good guys of the show, like, you know, taking care of the people. And I have a feeling that's probably going to be one of the first things that we see going into this next season is that they get linked up with them. And, you know, that's kind of like where the protagonist story goes, them doing good deeds. But, um, 
we're going to see it, the, there's still so much with the brotherhood of steel that has to come out and um, we'll see. I'm excited. Flex any predictions. <sighs> predictions. I, I, I said my Maximus hot take where he could go bad. I think that would be awesome. Mm. Um, another thing is that I, I actually disagree with you, Doc. I kind of like the vault storyline, the conspiracy. I'm a big conspiracy theory guy. Buds, buds. <laughs> I kind of like that whole thing, but we never actually see Lucy's brother enter that cryo chamber. Yeah. Mm. You yep. never actually see him enter it. Maybe that brain robot bud like recruits him to take over for a failing Betty, perhaps. I don't know. Um, I think that's just one little thing to look out for. We never actually see him go into the crowd chamber. That 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 brother, it's uh, Hannah Montana's brother. I when I saw him in episode right. one, I was like, I rolled my eyes. I'm like, I girl. thought this show was gonna be better. Oh no wait. <laughs> it was like I thought the show had was had better like ambitions. That's literally what I thought. He was pretty good in this. Yeah, I know. He was good. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had another I had a question because like I just lingering questions. Um Moldaver. Like she was around 250 years ago. How the hell is she around right now at the finale? Exactly. Can you explain that yeah. to us, Bill? Um, so it's it's I'm I'm assuming the way they're gonna frame it is those cryo tubes. Um and that is also prevalent in Fallout 4 too. Um, without going too deep into that story. But yes, so there are these cryo tubes that can freeze you. So I'm sure she wasn't on the surface for two hundred something years, but um, you know, she came out at some point. Because I was thinking she's not a part of like the Buds Buds program because she's like against right everything Vault Tech is doing. So maybe she had access to that technology. You know, she seems like a pretty resourceful person. And I don't know, someone's probably someone that aligns with her and her ideology. Maybe like helped her out or something. But it's just something I was thinking about after. I'm like, how the hell did she survive? Mm. Um, I kind of well, thought so that acting performance was good too. By the way, uh, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I mean, um, the same thing with Lucy's father. I mean, obviously, we know he was, like, cryoed, but same thing. You know, he must have been out for almost 200 years. And then, He's and also then blind. <laughs> we forget, in that flashback, he, he was blind. Was he? He was not looking Coop in the eye. Like, he was, was blind? Like, I don't think he was blind. I what? Was blind. I didn't catch on to that. I didn't hear I, that. I think, <laughs> was. I think that was a problem with the de-aging, where it's like they you de-aged think? him, and they made it look like he's blind. <laughs> I'm Googling was Hank blind. <laughs> oh, that's an unanswered question. What are you talking about? Dude, I think he was, man. Yeah. Did I, you know when they said Henry that they were like, you know, the big reveal? Did you like, oh, they're talking about Lucy's dad? I no. actually didn't catch on. Yeah. That, 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 would, that blew me away where it was like the motivation for the ghoul where he said, when I heard the name McLean, like I knew I had mm. to keep walking. Right. The, the hidden motivation, how you stick with the character no matter what, that was pretty crazy. Um, Okay. Uh, I don't have any other lingering questions here. Uh, Ricky Flex, you got anything else for our, our expert here, Joey G? He's done a phenomenal job so far. Our new video game correspondent. Yeah, Joe, show that off to the YouTube. Well, can you see that shirt? Nuka Cola. Nuka Cola, oh, baby. Joe, oh, Joe, Joey G, I had another question. The dog. The dog. Is that a huge part of the show? That is the first companion that you get pretty much when you start the game so yeah it's kind of uh it's a good like you know foot in the door thing it, it was good to see that yeah i'm trying to think if there's any other like small things that you saw the code i, I read something about the code that was entered at the end did you notice anything about that <laughs> yeah are you talking about the password um, yeah uh, yeah for the, yeah for the um cold fusion uh so i didn't i'm not sure if i noticed it for the cold fusion but um if you're referring to the um it, while they're in the vault and they're trying to get into the um, I can't think of the like the the leader's um, computer, the terminal. Okay. And okay. he had all those names mm -hmm. going down in like different figures and stuff, and he had to pick a name. That's like a du direct copy of what you do in the game to hack into stuff. So there's like a little puzzle with you have to identify the names that have certain um, letters the same and stuff. So that was cool. But uh, it, maybe that was for the cold fusion thing too. I didn't notice though. All right, that's a, I read something about it and seemed like people were calling that out on social media. Uh, Ricky Flex, are you still here? What's up with you right now? I'm still here. What do you frozen mean? in time. Your camera, oh, yeah, your cryo chamber, your buds bud. Right? <laughs> You're gonna turn your turn your Ricky's camera. Ricky's a bud bud. Oh, he's uh, frozen. Okay, this is a good. I think this is a good wrap up point then. Okay, let's put Ricky in the cryo chamber. Let's put him to sleep, and then uh, we'll <laughs> we'll move is. on. But Ridiculous. renewed for season two. Renewed for season two. Much to uh, our excitement. 
this has been a hit. And this was a awesome. fun watch, entertaining watch. Joey G, thank you for hopping on. Our new video game correspondent, um, truly an expert in the Fallout realm. We'll keep up to date. Any type of news, we'll have you back on.